what we had, I think, to learn painfully already during the discussion of President Trump with the Taliban is that every European approach or the approach of every European member state in Afghanistan depends on the USA. So the moment the U Biden confirmed the US withdrawal and the moment the US troops withdraw, there was no way either the French or the German or even the EU as a whole could stay and continue a military presence. Nevertheless, I mean, strategically, politically, we would have liked to stay longer, to have a much smoother withdrawal, to organize things better, but it was impossible because the US decided to withdraw. And that is where all these voices are now coming from saying, we need a stronger European defense policy. We need a stronger European foreign policy. However, um, I want to caution a little. Um, we had these calls in the past quite often. And then whenever we were facing a concrete crisis or a situation where not all EU member states were on the same page from the very beginning, things easily fell apart. And even here we saw, you mentioned the European Union, so uh, the high representative Borrell, but also Charles Michel, also La von der Leyen, they were very silent. And only on Monday we had a statement from only 25 EU member states. So those who watched it carefully realized there are two missing. And as long as we have this anonymity procedure in the Foreign Affairs Council, I think it will remain very difficult to have a strong and own European Union stance in any of these tricky situations. Well, I think all of us who believe in human rights have to fight for this political willingness. At least me as a politician, I mean, of course I can say it's more difficult than in 2015, or there are all these, well, examples of things that are there that you just mentioned. Or I'm going to say, listen, these are people that run away from Taliban, who we consider to be a terrorist group. They will not have a safe refuge either in Pakistan or Iran or in Uzbekistan. And also why should these countries take care of millions and millions of refugees where, while we are not even accept to, uh, able to accept, let's say, 50,000 for EU member states. Um, and and I, I really want us to, to, to have this human perspective on it and to fight for it. And well, con contrary to the legend, we managed to do that in 2015. And we managed to do that rather well. And most of the places, the capacity is, the room for refugees is still there. So the alternative option could be to say, we managed that in 2015, we have learned some lessons. We can also support in this crisis as much as we did in 2015, but because we don't wait until they are at our borders in a much more constructive and orderly way. And I would really much like us to have this kind of a discussion. Given the situation in which we are now with the troops being withdrawn and also our room to negotiate with the Taliban being rather limited, it would be very difficult to be honest. The Taliban have issued a statement this time that they took over power that they will protect uh, the women's rights according to the rule of the Sharia. Well, there are many different interpretations of the Sharia and also already back in the 90s with the very, very repressive regime of the Taliban, they have based that also on the rule of the Sharia. That's, that was their point of reference back then. So it doesn't give me too much of a confidence that it will be better this time. Um, I nevertheless think all the possibilities we have um, in terms of conditionality, in terms of reminding them of their word, in terms of increasing pressure, we need to use it. And the more countries we are putting this pressure on the Taliban. So if we are 27 EU plus UK, plus USA, plus Canada, plus Australia, plus Japan, this makes us quite big. There we can have, if we all agree on making this a priority, we, I think, can still have some impact because the Taliban, they will need money to run this country. Of course, China and also Russia have already kind of stepped in, but in the long run, they also cannot sustain the Taliban. And here, I think we have to put pressure on Pakistan. Many people in the recent discussion have forgotten the 
destructive role of Pakistan in all of this. Um, and we need to be very clear that all kind of um, economic support beyond humanitarian aid that doesn't go through Taliban, that goes directly through the organizations. So everything beyond that has to be based on conditionality. Um, and the other aspect is we need to protect those women that I think rightfully fear for their lives. Many of them are still in Afghanistan. They want to get out. They don't get visa. The main problem there is that if you don't have an orderly resettlement progress, it's the strongest that make it out. So it's even the women that send their men to go first because they can't go with the kids, for example, to all these checkpoints and stuff and hope that they will take them in. We also have cases of local workers of, for example, the German Bundeswehr, so the German armed forces, um, who have put in their request for visa for themselves and their families, but it was only them and not their wives and children that were taken on board and accepted for these planes. So here also, I think we have a responsibility to think about the women also when it comes to resettlement. I don't think that the West, Western community, if it still exists, that's an issue for another discussion, um, should recognize the Taliban and when they form a transitional government as they announce, and it is based on democratic procedures. Well, you could consider that, but the Taliban, even their, their, more, their leadership and their PR press conference said there's not going to be democracy in Afghanistan. And I think as long as there is not going to be democracy in Afghanistan, um, there is little room for recognition from EU member states, from the US and others. But we will have to see which countries recognize Afghanistan and the regime there. And this may actually also show the well, who's on what side when it comes to this fight between autocracies and democracies that we see in other regions as well. We have clearly seen that they can be more adaptive in their tools. They have also negotiated with the US, who has been like their biggest enemy, but they agreed to negotiate well, for their own purpose. And now they speak a nicer English for their own purpose. They have this human face for their own purpose. I don't think that their purpose has changed. And I would be happy if I'm wrong. So I would be happy if they have really changed and if women can really go to school and if women can really be news anchors and stuff. But the first things we see on the ground we see that they raid houses of people who worked for the international community, that they kill women. They have just today um, told the a female news anchor of the state produced um, television that she can no longer appear in front of the camera. So, I mean, they will be judged by their actions and not by their words. And if I look at their actions this time, they are already compromising the nice words they put forward in press conferences. So I wouldn't give much for their words.